Not a lot of people think about food in the media they consume. When was the last time you thought about the Teen Titans ordering pizza, or that post credit scene from the Avengers where they're eating out in a mostly destroyed restaurant, or that time in The Boys when Chewy and his dad are talking about pizza rolls? Maybe you thought about that one, but that was because Chewy shouted the word seven, not because of the pizza rolls. The writers of these stories, however, pay a lot of attention to food. Beast Boy and Cyborg arguing over pepperoni is a fundamental disagreement about their respective ways of life. Chewy! His dad thought that pizza rolls were one of the things he understood about his son, and he turned out to be completely wrong. And the Avengers? They just fought a bunch of space worms. They need some cooldown time. And really, that's the point of food in a lot of stories. Cooldown time. When the story's getting intense and everybody's feeling heated, you have a meal to rekindle relationships, remind the characters that the people in their life still care about them. But Invincible handles food a little differently. This is your spoiler warning, so if you haven't watched Invincible yet, you should really fix that. It's 5 hours and 20 minutes of awkward teens, awkward adults, lots of drama, and even more super fight spectacle. And if you think you already know what happens because of the memes... That's the neat thing. You don't. So the thing about food in Invincible is that it rarely ever fits the role we're used to seeing it fill in other stories. Most of the time, food is a means for people to connect with one another. It's a moment of peace and respite from the plot. But Invincible bakes its plot into every meal, and if you so much as dare to suggest that it has a meal without plot, it beats you over the head with more plot. The show is very good at hiding this. On a first watch, you see the dinners with the Graysons, and the booze, and the burgers, and the occasional mention of PIZZA. As just that, these are heroes, but they're also people, and people tend to eat and talk about food. But other shows have heroes who are people, and those shows don't have nearly as much food in them. That end credit scene with the Avengers? That's like the only food scene in the entire movie. And that feels normal, but the excessive presence of food in Invincible coupled with the intensity of its plot tells me there is no way they're doing this for kicks or realism. There is a reason for all of this uneaten food, and broskies, it is a doozy. I'm Jordan Szymanski, the guy at the Little Caesars with the balls to refuse napkins. Welcome to Why Is There So Much Goddamn Food In In- So to give you all an idea of how I run my food analysis, I'll start by picking apart two characters that seem to have nothing to do with the main plot. After that, I'm going to go through the rest of the meals in the show by category as seamlessly as I can, and hopefully wrap it all up in a conclusion by the end of the video. Sound good? Cool, so let's talk about Steve and Matt. Invincible's first episode opens on a quiet conversation between Steve and his co-worker as they share a cup of coffee and check on the people coming into the White House. They're a lot more interested in the coffee and conversation than checking people in, and soon we see why. Steve talks about his stepson Matt and how much the boy's been pulling himself together, and after a love-filled speech about said boy's progress, his co-worker smirks and teases him for getting all teary-eyed. Steve responds in kind before the Mahler twins interrupt their normal, quiet life with plot. This conversation is important because it sets a myriad of standards for the show. This this random guy who only appears in one other episode after this one is given enough character and life that he feels like he could fill the shoes of a main character. I got so lost in the emotional impact of this scene that I thought that Mark's name was Matt and that this guy was his new father and these were Matt's birth parents. I was so confused because I thought there's no way they'd put this much effort into some random guy for no reason. And I was right, there is a reason. The reason is that this is a human being who happens to live in a world with superpowers and aliens and crazy technology. That doesn't make him less human. He has a wife and a son and a life that has nothing to do with the supernatural stuff we see until it comes out of nowhere and scares the shit out of him. This also sets a precedent for what a normal meal in the show would be if it ever got one. Two guys bonding over a cup of joe and razzing each other the whole way through. It's funny, it's engaging, and it makes us feel for both characters involved because it tells us who they are. And the sudden, jarring interruption of the Mahler twins also sets a precedent. What we just saw is only half of the show's premise. Everyone's human, and this is what they have to deal with. We have mental illness, a pandemic, a failing economy. They have beings that could destroy the Earth and not even break a sweat. This is all further compounded by the intro scene of episode 2, when Steve and Matt are in England seeing Buckingham Palace. This scene doesn't look like it has anything to do with food until the trash bag Mark threw in episode 1 flies through the air and crashes into them mid-conversation. In a way it's funny, but if you're binging the show, you're coming straight out of episode 1's ending scene to this. It makes for a hell of a shock until we understand that everything's fine, it's just ketchup, maybe some rotten beef or whatever, but nobody's dead. 
here anyway. And the only reason nothing bad happened is that Matt acted so quickly. Then Matt reveals the truth of the situation to us through the powerful statement, Yeah, I didn't know they had burger marts here. Why is it powerful? Because if there's one thing unifying the world right now, it's food. I have never visited another country in my life, but unless it was North Korea, I would be relatively surprised if there wasn't a single McDonald's anywhere in it. Crappy, fatty American cuisine is something I see as a constant in the world, something we can all at least vaguely understand. The sentence, I didn't know they had burger marts here, is Matt's acknowledgement that even when things are different for everyone, some things stay the same. This acknowledgement coming before you just called me dad provides us with this message. No matter where you are, family is still family. These are the two brightest bits of food usage in the show, and it's important that they have nothing to do with the main cast. These meals where the food is only tangentially related and the mood is so heartwarming and emotional are the standard by which we will judge every meal in the series. And roughly 83% of those meals failed to clear the bar these two set on their own. Don't believe me? Let's look at the Graysons. The Graysons love talking about food, but they rarely ever actually eat any. One of the few exceptions I could find is when Mark's eating cereal on the couch while he and his mom are watching TV. She laments they can't have breakfast together, Mark says it's the White House, it's more important, Debbie goes White House, shite house, we know the scene. It's a good example of how they view Nolan's heroics. Mark idolizes and wants to be like Nolan, but to Debbie, saving the country is just her husband's job. It's also the only instance of breakfast in the whole show, unless you're a college student, in which case, a cup of coffee counts. Following this, Mark complains that his parents are going out for German bratwurst while he's at school, highlighting the restrictions he's under and the freedoms they enjoy. We don't see them eat the bratwurst, not even when they bring some back home for dinner later. In fact, at that dinner, no one eats anything on the table. Debbie touches the plates when she's setting everything up, but the food is not even looked at afterwards. It's all about Mark getting his powers and Nolan's tense question, Are you sure? You can scour the whole series, and you will not find a single instance of the Graysons eating together as a family. You'll find two family dinners, but no one is actually eating at them. The second of these is when Mark asks his parents for advice on whether he should help Titan or not, which gets a stern no from Nolan, and what amounts to follow your judgment from Debbie. These dinners aren't here for comfort or company, but for tension and anxiety. This family looks normal, it feels normal, even for the people in it, but it's not normal. It never could be. Mark's too young to understand the burden on either of his parents' shoulders, Debbie's a normal human so she doesn't know what it's like to fight for her life, and Nolan is literal worlds apart from either of them. They don't eat together because they can't. There's no reconnecting them right now, no matter how much they wish they could. And boy does Nolan wish he could. A fourth of all the meals that happen in this show happen because Nolan is looking for connection, and most of the time it's with his family. He wants to spend their last days together, well, together. Of course, neither Mark nor Debbie can know they're the last days, so it's difficult for him to articulate that. As a result, he defaults to food, which is pretty insensitive given what's going on when he does. From straight up saying, I'm dying for some real food, to his son, who just learned the first person he tried to save just died, to immediately planning to get pizza. After the Guardian's funeral, Nolan is so desperate for connection that he's willing to risk some serious social faux pas to get it. And the kinda shitty thing is, it works. In the same episode as the funeral, he semi-jokingly suggests they grill a squid monster for dinner, and Debbie laughs. He makes reservations for the first time ever, and it actually wins her over a bit. He never tries to do this with Mark, though. Despite what Nolan says in the last scenes of the show, his actions say that he values his love for Debbie way more than his love for Mark. Mark is his lineage, but that is a means to an end. The end of human independence. Or... There is a more twisted way to view these meals. Picture your pet, or a pet you would like to have. If you're a clean freak and don't like pets, picture your favorite broom. You're gonna move soon, and for whatever reason, you can't take them with you. Now, you can't have a reasonable discussion with a dog or a broom, so you don't bother trying. You just cuddle them, hold them, play with them, give them walks. You make them feel loved in the last few days you have together, before selling them to someone else. Thinking about Nolan doing this to Debbie makes me feel sick. 
but it's possible. And as much as I would love to believe that Nolan really, truly cares for her as a person, Invincible's writers like twisting the knife too much for me to trust that interpretation. Plus, it makes a lot of sense. Losing a pet is still a very traumatic experience, regardless of what pet they might be. So even in this interpretation, there's still genuine love here. Just, you know, not enough to value Debbie as a person with thoughts and feelings and agency. Speaking of Debbie, let's talk about how she feels about food. Debbie's a major narrative foil for Nolan because she's looking to keep the connections she has, but she has no reason to think she could lose them until the risk is already present. She doesn't know Nolan's been attacked until the GDA comes knocking at her door. Once she finds out, caring for Nolan is all that matters to her. So much so that she doesn't cook fresh meals for Mark, since she's spending so much time at the Pentagon. At best, she makes frozen dinners for him. At worst, she just buys them. This is more emphasis on the fact that she's not taking care of Mark while Nolan's healing, but she does apologize, and she's there for him, so she's a good mom. It's a minor lapse in caretaking at most, and it actually shows us why Mark is the way he is. Nolan's been so busy saving the world that he never had time for his son. Mark wanted Powers to be like his dad because it gives them something more to talk about, something to do as father and son. But you shouldn't need to be like your dad for your dad to want to spend time with you. That's what Debbie teaches Mark. They're very different, different sex and different race, but they can still talk. They can still know each other, no matter what difference there may be in the worlds they live in. Nolan's great at killing, but Debbie's great with words, and the pen is mightier than the sword. Something something written apology here, because now we're talking about Mark and Amber's relationship with food. There's only two mentions of dinner with these two, Mark missing dinner with Amber's mom and getting his ass handed to him instead of going to the soup kitchen. These are the two big blunders he makes in episode 5. Yes, the latter was well intentioned, but mistakes don't pay attention to morality. He trusted the wrong guy, and got himself and two friends seriously injured. This sucks, because their budding romance is so sweet the writers even pull out the dessert menu for it and soon make me wish they hadn't. Look, I love dessert. My family has special recipes for fudge, brownies, Rocky Road, and like 20 different pies, cookies, and cakes. It's awesome, but even a kid can get sick of that shit when there's too much of it, and the Mark Amber ship catches that feeling perfectly. In episode 5, Mark brings Amber cheesecake when he's late to meet her after school. Then Mark misses dinner with Amber's mom, which puts him on serious ice. But he brought dessert, so that's fine, right? Amber doesn't eat any of it, and I don't blame her. It's sickening watching him do this to their relationship when it felt so sweet in the beginning. Just like the toxic waste he keeps bringing into her home. He's trying to butter her up, trying to do right by her, but he doesn't understand how to do that while also living up to his father's expectations. This is a clear-cut confusion of love languages. One of Mark's love languages is gift giving, which, yeah, Amber can appreciate on a good day, but it doesn't save him from not being present enough and lying to her face about why. Her love language is quality time, which Mark desperately wants to give her, but he is so weighed down by Nolan's expectations of him that he can't. So he gives her gifts, because money is something he doesn't need time to spend, but it's not enough. It can never be enough. There's a lot to analyze regarding the parallels the show draws between Mark and Titan in this episode, but that's for someone else to tackle. What I'm interested in is what isn't there in Titan's case. There is no apology cheesecake or missed dinners and afterthought dessert. The butterscotch ripple is there because it's what his daughter asked him for. As far as she's concerned, he's doing everything right. Dessert in Invincible isn't strictly about sweet things that turn sour or half-assed pleas for forgiveness or attention. It can be genuinely good parenting too. But dessert being unwelcome is also not specific to Mark and Amber, as Nolan uses it to interrupt Debbie when she finds Dark Blood's notes. He doesn't know he's interrupting anything, but dessert sure as hell doesn't sound sweet to Debbie at the time. It's jarring and unwelcome, so clearly not a good thing to have. So what exactly is dessert supposed to symbolize here? A good friend of mine says the original comics used food as a symbol for change. When the food tasted bad, the change was bad. When the food tasted good, the change was good. Dessert is a nice play on this concept in the show because it symbolizes a lack of change. Minus its presence in episode 3, where it actually is a good change, something Mark's not used to. He's adjusting to having Amber in his life, and he likes the adjustment. All the other dessert is in episode 5, where a refusal to commit to that adjustment throws a wedge in their relationship. When Mark shows up with pie or cake, it means nothing has changed at all. 
Same thing with Titan and the Ice Cream, which is good news for his daughter, but bad news for his wife. She wants things to change, she wants to get out of the deal they're in with Machine Head, but kids with loving parents kinda want things to stay the same, especially when they know that life could change at any minute, which, given their financial situation, yeah, it probably can. As for Eclair d'Andre, Debbie just found Darkblood's notes, which are themselves a marker for change. Nolan is oblivious to this, and thus to him, nothing has changed, so he talks about desserts. This also makes sense physically, sugar has a tendency to make one sedentary in large amounts, and build fat in the body, which leads to more prolonged sedentary activity later on. Crap, where was I? Right, Mark and Amber. So in the following episode, when the two of them are at Upstate University, they're spending tons of time together and they make sure to pick up some hot dogs and fries, which we actually do see them reach for and eat together. Which, for your info, is the only time we see Mark eat any of the food in the show with another person. Other people are always present when he eats, but they do not eat with him. This isn't a false positive, they really are happy to spend time together and rekindle their relationship, right before it falls apart. On a first viewing, this is one of the most positive meals in the show, but on a second, it is the most bittersweet, hands down. Crap food like the hot dogs and fries in the Marber montage has no positive association besides that scene. Well, okay, it did almost crash into Steve and Matt, thus prompting the lovely ubiquitous family message, but that's more a byproduct of the crap being dangerous and bad for you. The Mahler twins use this shit to clone themselves. It is not good on its own merits. It's the subject of harsh but real joking on William's part and... kinda complicated in the second to last scene of the show? This needs some context. Okay, time for a personal anecdote. So does anybody else remember that one scene in Ed, Ed, and Eddie where Jimmy and Sarah are having a picnic and some kind of gray sludge that may or may not be cement, I don't know, gets on Jimmy's sandwich? Well, when I saw that scene as a kid, I felt genuinely sad that the sandwich wasn't gonna be eaten. Maybe it's because I grew up in a poor household where we were lucky if we got Tony's pizza for dinner instead of peanut butter sandwiches every night. But seeing wasted food always gave me that hollow feeling of loss. Well, William gave me that feeling here. In this car, Mark doesn't even look at his food, and even William can't force himself to eat it while Mark's there. He vents his frustrations and anger at Mark, and his friend's only response is, I know, I'm sorry, I suck. He can't bring himself to hate Mark, but he can't handle Mark's total negativity either. So he swaps to positive realist mode and mutilates his burger to make a point. This is the scene that made me decide to make this video. I have never felt more emotionally attacked than to have food wasted to make a point about how shitty a boyfriend a character I heavily relate to was. And part of the reason I relate to this is that I was a shitty boyfriend too. My first girlfriend was when I was a Jew. My first girlfriend was when I was a Jew. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> My first girlfriend was when I was a junior in high school, and I was such a pushy, inconsiderate fuck that she dumped me by text twice. That took me a long time to get over, so I definitely identify with Mark in this car. Crap food in Invincible is a catalyst to bad things. Not horrible, awful, worst case scenario bad things, but more of the usual bad stuff we deal with in our everyday. It's a marker for the societal problems of the show, not the titanic issues addressed in its more dramatic scenes. It is a wind-down meal, but rather than positivity, it just offers us a more understandable and normalized sadness. Also, what the fuck kind of freak are you, William? The meat's still in the bag! Just reach in there and put it on the butt again! Don't you dare take that bite! What happened? I blacked out there for a second. Was it chicken pot pie night? Well, for some reason I feel tense, so let's talk about coffee. It's a really wholesome drink in Invincible, either as a prep drink for when the supers need to get their game on, or just a surprisingly standard meal. The first we see of it is Steve's talk with his co-worker in episode 1, which I've already covered. Then Nolan decides to make it for Mark when he sees how wiped out the kid is. That's not so much concern as it is making sure Mark's ready to work, but it's not wholly negative at least. Far more compelling uses of it come before Titan's fight at the start of episode 5 and Eve's first morning in her new place. I particularly like the subtle anti-smoking rap the show throws in by having the first two mooks he slaughters be lighting up when he comes around. He downs the coffee, downs the mooks, and it's fight scene time! This may just be propaganda for coffee, but I actually like coffee and I hate cigarettes, so this one tickled me a little. Eve's morning routine 
made me feel all warm and fuzzy though. She's feeling refreshed and happy and truly like herself for the first time in a long time. She makes the brewing process look insanely easy with her powers, demonstrating an incredible proficiency with them that makes me wish she was a real person. Real world Earth could really use an Adam Eve. She's also drinking out of a Teen Team mug to show us that just because she's moved on from being a superhero, that doesn't mean she's left it behind. This scene is about Eve rekindling her relationship with herself, finding herself again, and loving what she's found. Between these four scenes, we have Nolan and Debbie at a cafe in Italy. Like the first scene with Steve, the coffee is not as important as the conversation. Unlike that scene, the conversation here has a lot of weight to it. What with Nolan's deceptions laced into every word, and the presence of the mugs making it all the more layered. Nolan's interest in Julius Caesar is accepted as a talking point by Debbie, and the two of them do drink from their glasses at roughly the same time. Then the conversation shifts to reminiscing about how they got together. This is them finding the love again, reminding themselves and each other that what they have together is real. But come on, a positive marriage in this show? The conversation quickly shifts to a discussion about how Nolan is under suspicion of murdering the Guardians of the Globe, as he should be because he did. But he doesn't tell Debbie that, he just says Cecil thinks he did. And then surprise, dragon attack! Nolan refuses to lift a finger to help until Debbie says she trusts him. And even after she does, he lets Cecil's guys take care of it, causing far more collateral damage as a result. Nolan's basically holding the town hostage to force Debbie to tell him she trusts him. The reason I think he doesn't understand that is because he's conditioned to see humans as disposable. Yet he doesn't realize at the moment that Debbie's included in that category. In this moment, he cares deeply for her and needs to know that she's with him on this. He needs her support to take over the world. And because Debbie doesn't fully understand that's what he's asking of her, she gives it to him. And then Nolan gets ready for another sip of his coffee. As far as he's concerned, this interaction was entirely positive. A meal fit for a king. Speaking of crowned royals, let's talk about alcohol, because oh man, there is a ton of it. Full disclosure, I've made a personal pledge never to drink in my life, but I know a lot of people who do drink, so I asked for their opinions on the subject. I also did some research about the different degrees of strength for beer, whiskey, and wine, the three drinks involved in the show, and the reasons people drink them. I don't know why I feel the need to validate my ability to talk about some drinks I've never had, probably because intellectuals like to shut people up. Anyway, for this section I'm gonna do things a little bit differently to keep the discussion concise. I'm gonna talk about the three drinks separately because they all mean very different things, starting with wine. Debbie drinks a lot of wine when she's going through the stages of grief over Nolan, and Nolan only shares the bottle with her once. Even then, they aren't drinking together, they just happen to use the same bottle. Nolan seems to be a social drinker, he doesn't really touch alcohol unless he's with someone else, whereas Debbie picks up the wine glass when she feels sorta nervous about the possibility of Nolan killing their friends. There are a couple scenes where Debbie's drinking wine alone just for Nolan to walk in on her, and when there are only 10 or so instances of alcohol in the show, that's too much to be a coincidence. She's a wine mom, and like lots of wine moms in fiction, her usage of the drink is… pretty unhealthy. It's her coping mechanism, and alcohol as a coping mechanism is not ideal. Not that I blame her, of course, I mean, fuck. Art sure can't blame her either, as whiskey is essentially his replacement for Debbie's wine. He drinks it during the sad montage in episode 8, and shares a glass with Debbie when she needs it in the same episode. He also offered it to her before they looked over Nolan's suit in episode 6 to try to put off actually looking at the suit. So why separate wine and whiskey at the beginning if I'm just gonna wind up saying they're the same thing, a coping mechanism? I did that because there are subtle differences if you look closely enough. Wine is considered to be the proper, acceptable drink, because it's got a much lower lower alcohol content than hard liquors like whiskey, a little over a quarter the alcohol by volume. It's still over twice as strong as beer though, so it's definitely something you could drink to cope or forget without needing too much of it. But the most important thing about wine is that it can easily sneak up on you if you're not careful. Whiskey is something you'll feel within minutes of drinking the glass, since its alcohol content is so high. Wine, however, is in that sweet spot of ABV that makes people underestimate it. You have a glass of wine and you think, hey, that wasn't too bad, and then you have another glass, and then another. Four glasses in and the first glass starts catching up to you, and the next thing you know, you're waking up on the couch next to a broken vase. If we think about this in terms of Debbie discovering the truth, wine becomes the perfect drink for her. The first hints of Nolan's actions only get noticed when the third and fourth series of hints start to come to light. It tasted so sweet at first, but the buzz is catching up faster than she expected, and at this point, she's no longer safe. 
It's also worth noting that whiskey only shows up in Art's basement, away from all eyes but Debbie, while Debbie drinks wine in her kitchen, where Mark or Nolan could come home at any moment. Debbie doesn't think she has a problem because she doesn't feel the need to hide it. Dealing with her problems this way is perfectly normal to her. Art is perfectly aware that whiskey isn't a good coping mechanism, and others might disapprove of him using it. He doesn't strike me as someone who'd feel ashamed to use it, especially in this situation, but he does only use it in one episode and hint at it in another. Debbie's got a wine glass with her at the table in episode 1, and she upgrades to whiskey in episode 8. Art understands moderation, even if his drink is stronger than hers. One other trope about whiskey before we move on. It's often thought of as the manly drink, and it was pretty common to seal business in ye olden west with a clinking of whiskey glasses. Contracts were forged, boats were christened, churches built all with the same shared drink. Or wait, didn't they break wine bottles on ships to christen them? Whatever, you get my point. This last scene where Debbie tells Art to pour her a glass. This is pivotal. This is why I think Debbie's going to overcome these problems rather than falling deeper into them. She needs the coping mechanism, that much is certain, but she's not using something that'll sneak up on her. She knows exactly what she's asking for. No, not asking, demanding. Art tells her he only has the one glass. He can't make a contract with her. This isn't about a promise between the two of them. It can never be that. I don't care. Poor. Debbie, the female partner to the strongest superhero in the world, is telling that man's tailor she doesn't need him. This isn't a promise to Art. This is a promise to herself, and she just happens to be using Art's glass to make it. She'll take that historic masculine pride and drink it straight, and she doesn't care how uncomfortable it makes anyone else. She's her own woman now. This drink is her last send-off to the man that Nolan was. She'll probably still have some issues to come as a result of this loss, but she will surpass them. Speaking of Nolan, let's talk about beer. Nolan's second of two times he drinks in the show is when he brings a six-pack over to Art's shop in order to reconnect. What he's really doing is making sure Art keeps quiet about the Guardian's murder. Except, is it? Nolan certainly behaves like he still sees Art as a friend. A human friend, and thus a friend who will die very quickly relative to Nolan's lifespan, but still a friend. It's difficult to tell in any one interaction in this series which side of Nolan is talking. The soldier loyal to Viltrum, or the family man superhero. In this scene, I think it's mostly the latter, because the former wouldn't see Art as a threat. Art managed to make a fabric that doesn't rip or burn away when Nolan breaks the sound barrier. He is intimately aware of exactly how easily Nolan could kill him. Nolan doesn't need to intimidate him, he wants to stay friends with him. But all this shared drink does is give us a look into Art's mind and highlight how irreparable their friendship is. Beer seems to like highlighting broken relationships. Right after Amber definitely breaks up with Mark, she goes to a party looking for a rebound and doesn't find one. Instead, she finds a can of beer and a whole lot of sad. She needs the coping mechanism, needs the social life, but Mark didn't leave her. For all his flaws, he still takes her back, even after she distrusted him. He works hard to understand where she's coming from, honestly too hard with how badly he treats himself as a result. Amber has to live with that guilt. She's not at fault. But that doesn't stop her from feeling like she is. Alcohol is the inverse of coffee in Invincible. Coffee shows up five times, and only one of them is unpleasant. Alcohol shows up in almost every episode, and only one time is it pleasant. The new Guardians of the Globe drink in two scenes. The first when they try to celebrate what they think was a job well done, before Black Samson shows them just how badly they messed up. What was supposed to be a fun team meal turns into a full-blown argument. Look at Shrinking Ray, she goes all itty-bitty because she's embarrassed. Oh my god, she's so cute. The second is when Monster Girl gets out of the hospital. Rex displays some unorthodox intelligence through beer-filled milk cartons, and the whole team really gets to celebrate as a team. This is undeniably positive. The team's bonds have been forged after fighting Machine Head's goons, so now they really have people to party with. Even robots die, 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 die bug fails to completely ruin in the cheery atmosphere. Granted, the only reason it doesn't ruin it is because Rex is there, and as much of a shit heel as he is, he's also great at lightening the mood. That's because he's got superpowers, though. He can defend himself, so he can afford to take dangerous shit with a lot more levity than, say, Rick Sheridan, who offers to get some beer and pizza for the lovebirds and gets ganked by Sinclair's robo-zombies. Trying to use alcohol as a recovery method puts him in danger. But hold on a second, pizza? Pizza. 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 Pizza.
It's hot. We've managed to avoid the conspiracy stuff so far, but now's when we put on the tinfoil hats, because pizza is only mentioned three times in Invincible. It is never eaten, it's never even on screen, and the three moments when it's mentioned are Rick's disappearing act right after the Graysons come back from the Guardian's personal funeral, and after Mark and Debbie come back from the Pentagon in the last episode. Three of the lowest and most tense points in the show. Let's break them down. Right after the funeral ends, Nolan talks about getting pizza like nothing they just had to go through even matters. It demonstrates how completely tone-deaf he is in this situation. Except Nolan's not stupid. Even if he doesn't value the lives of other humans as much as he does Debbie or Mark, he understands that they value those lives. The only reason he'd bring up pizza at a time like this is that he's not thinking straight. The guy murdered his own friends and is actively hiding it from his family. If I were going through that, I'd be trying to think about it as little as possible. And knowing what comes next, Nolan's also looking for a chance to spend quality time with his family, as much of it as he can before he has to do away with the illusion that it could go on forever. And he actually gets a little of that chance later the same episode, when he semi-jokingly suggests they cook up the squid monster into calamari. Nolan gets away with trivializing the death of his friends by proposing that his wife and son spend time with him. Not so for Rick, who is punished by suggesting that pizza could assuage their troubles with the mechanizing of half his body and near complete loss of his personality. Nolan is able to get away from consequences social and karmic that normal people do not withstand. A monster is treated as an innocent, and an innocent becomes a monster. That's what pizza does in Invincible. Just bringing it up is inviting destruction to anyone who happens to be destructible. And all I need to prove that is the last pizza scene, but there's something I think needs to be covered before I can discuss it. What I'm about to discuss is pretty viscerally awful, and it kinda fucked up the whole show for me twice over, so if you have a weak stomach or something, skip to that timestamp. Everyone else ready? Okay. This is a meal. Hold on, don't click off the video yet, let me explain. The three necessary components of a meal in fiction are people, conversation, and food. That's how I see it anyway. Maybe some big brainy boy out there has a different set of conditions, but to me, if there's a people and a food stuff, and the people converse verbally or non-verbally, that's a meal. That's a broad as fuck definition, but I think you'll find in fiction that most definitions are broad. I argued that The Mask was a horror film in my genre class, and my professor ate that shit up. Which he should, because it is, but I'm getting off topic. So let's check the boxes here. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's definitely people. And they are definitely having a conversation. They've been talking to each other on and off for about 20 minutes of screen time now. You know, between the acts of filicide. But Jordan, I hear you ask, where's the food? Well, what are you talking about? I just said there's people here. You honestly gonna tell me that at no point during this clip does any blood or viscera find its way into Mark's screaming mouth? <laughs> Seriously, he's holding it open for the stuff. Nolan's feeding him like a baby. You could even call this a bonding exercise. They're making the food as Mark's eating it. Okay, I'll stop. But now you understand why this broke me. And if I have to suffer for it, then by God, so do you. This is the first time Nolan is being completely honest with his son. It's the only time that Mark eats anything while in Nolan's presence in the show. Nolan forces it to happen. Mark doesn't want it to happen, but it happens. Because Nolan, like most parents, is the one in control, and Mark is going to understand that. This is a father-son meal done so wrong it commits mass murder. Nolan is trying to force his son to understand and agree with him, and trying to force understanding in a child is often devastating. Just in this case, what's devastating to Mark and Nolan's relationship is also devastating to the world at large. That meal doesn't go well. Mark still doesn't understand. He refuses to understand, and he does understand exactly what that means. So Nolan decides that if he can't have a connection with his son, there's no use in having the son. Until he remembers what humanity has that Viltrumites cut out of themselves. Nolan tells us that the 20 years he spent here were a speck in the span of his life. But it's always the smallest parts of our lives that mean the most to us. 
We have a multitude of genres in Earth-based media that focus on teenagers and young adult life, even though that accounts for roughly 20 to 30 percent of our general lifespan. We put a lot of focus on what happens in our growing years when, in the grand scheme of things, they're a very small part of our lives. This is because for us, who only get to live a century if we're lucky, there's a growing need as we age to do the most we can with our lives before they're gone. When we're young, most of us don't have that pressure. We're innocent, unaware of the realities of the world, not yet understanding that our time in it is limited. Children allow us to remember what it was like to be so happily ignorant of cruelty and despair. Mark did that for Nolan too. And I don't think he's been able to feel innocent for a very long time. He can't bring himself to end that, to destroy this tiny speck of his life that shines brighter than the countless millennia he may have lived thus far. So, he leaves. And what follows is a series of half-meals. The first time Mark wakes up at the Pentagon, Debbie gives him water. And it better be water anyway, the kid's not in any shape to drink anything else. But what's important is it's the only water we see anyone drink in the show. It's Debbie trying to reconnect with Mark, through relief, to keep what's left of Nolan with her, but he pulls away from her. He's not ready. Not yet. Much later in Universe, when Mark and Debbie finally go back to that empty house, Mark has a flashback and then immediately goes looking for food. When he can't find any, he's about to order a pizza, but stops himself when he sees his mom. Is he really going to bring Calamity on their house again? Is he really going to be that tone-deaf the way that his father was at the funeral? Mark learns from his past. He's not going to be like his dad. He's going to be courteous and respect his mom's need to be alone. It's her turn not to be ready. Then things get better for a bit. Amber offers to get back together. Eve and William show up at the front door, and Mark demonstrates some agency in saying, let's go out. When they get there, though, everyone's too worried about Mark to touch their drinks. It's only after Mark leaves that people start sipping soda and William eats the burger, which I'll say was Mark's because it's funnier that way. Mark's dour mood is too much for anyone here to really connect or try to understand one another. As always, Mark is more important than the food in front of them. And even when they do connect, it's awkward and uncertain. The final biggest meal of Invincible, in fact, the last meal Mark eats in the show, is more horrifying than any conceived by the human mind. He does find hope again, but not with food. Food has done too much to hurt him. The reason why there's so much food in Invincible is so there can be too much food. Too many meals, too many connections made that were broken and repaired and broken again. The food is there to remind us that this story is not about the fight scenes by themselves. It's about the connections formed between the characters in it. The toxic, the wholesome, the toxically wholesome, and the wholesomely toxic. Food appears in every episode because it's natural for us to see it in everyday life, but unnatural to see it in every episode of a series. It makes the world in the cartoon feel too real to be comfortable with, which keeps us on the edge of our seats, watching not for the next fight scene, but for the next big twist. So basically I walked right into the trap the writers set for me, and I feel pretty happy that I went down the rabbit hole. I can only hope they put as much food into season 2 when it finally comes out so I can fall into the same trap again. Though now you all know what to look for, so I probably won't make a video on it. But who knows, maybe some other obscure bit of storytelling will grab my attention and I'll be back at the corkboard before we know it. Whatever happens, I'm excited to see the next season, and I'm grateful to all of you for watching this video. Please hit the like or dislike buttons to let me know how you felt about it. This one was a bit rambly, so I won't take it personally if you're not a fan. If you are a fan, though, and want to hear more rambling, you can check out my videos on Starlight Brigade and The Owl House down below. You can also subscribe and hit the bell icon so you're notified when I upload new videos. Not all of them are going to be main squeezes like this, though, so fair warning. Also, feel free to comment if you want to let me know in detail how you felt about this one. The comment section is one of my biggest motivators, so I'd really appreciate it. Lastly, I bit the bullet and started a Patreon, because I'm planning to move in the summer and funds are looking a little low. Every penny gets me closer to turning this insanity into my job, which is a dream I can only hope for. So if you've got the dosh to spare, it would make my week. Take it easy. I'll see you guys later. Peace. Shit.